Hi, my name is Fadi Ogunro and I am an under 40 CEO. The African Renaissance. The concept that the African people and nation shall overcome the current challenges confronting the continent and achieve cultural, scientific and economic renewal is here and with young men and women taking the lead. Some call them the new school heroes. We call them under 40 CEOs. Fadi Oguru is an ambitious techpreneur and innovative problem solver with goals to impact Africa by increasing digital gig work and self-sustainable employment. She possesses extensive knowledge of the changing technical approaches and workforce trends across Africa. With over 15 years experience in print and broadcast journalism, digital marketing, fashion, entertainment, and TV production, she began a career with Google in the UK, published articles in Vogue UK, Guardian Newspaper Nigeria, produced and hosted a popular radio show on the Bit 99.9 FM, as well as two TV shows for DSTV. In 2011, she co-founded Film Factory Productions, which specializes in TV advertising, documentaries, and music videos production. Her clients include General Electric, GT Bank, Coca-Cola, Microsoft, Ferrari, Puma, MTV, Lancome, MTN, Airtel, Wizkid, Tiwa Savage, and many more superstars. Collectively, the projects she produced within Africa has amassed over 1.5 billion views on YouTube and won various prestigious awards. Today, Fadil Guru is the founder and CEO at BookingsAfrica.com. All right, welcome to Under 40 Series, buddy. Thanks for having me. All right, amazing. Um, your British accent sort of gives you away. Uh, <laughs> you probably spent some time living in the United Kingdom. Um, but I also read somewhere you moved to the United Kingdom from Nigeria mm -hmm. at age seven. Um, I want to know, do you recall or have any memories from that time before you left? And why did you leave? All right. Um, yeah, I actually left... A I think it was around, I was eight to be ah, precise. Okay. Um, yes, I was born here. I went to St. Saviour's Primary School oh, in great. Ibutemeta because we lived in railway compound. Hmm. Um, and then my dad had uh, built a house in Ogutu GRA. So I went to Charlesville nice. Primary School for hmm. one term. When I left Ibutemeta, um, St. Saviour's, I was, hadn't finished my final year. I think I was in year three or primary three. So, um, I then left maybe my final term of primary three, went to Childsville, um, did an exam. I apparently had to do an exam to enter the school or whatever. And then they mm. gave me a double promotion or something. Oh, wow. So I ended up in like primary five or primary six. I, I was like, I think way ahead of everybody else. And then I was meant to do an exam for the common entrance, even mm. though I was like two years younger or three, two or three years younger than everybody else. And then I came home and my mom's like, oh, by the way, we're going to London next week. Forever. I was like, what? <laughs> and I started to get, I was really upset. I was wow. going to miss my friends. It's really traumatic enough that I'd left um, St. Saviour's and I'd left mm. some of my friends behind. I'm finally making new friends in Childville. And then literally like a month or two after attending Childville, I left and moved to the United Kingdom with my mama. Why? Mm. Because I kind of have to ask her. I really don't know. When you're <laughs> eight, you don't really ask questions, do you? You just, all right, mom. Hmm. And, you know, my mom's mixed race, so she's half English, half hmm. Nigerian. So um, we've been to see her family in the UK a few times. So, um, and they always say it's better for education. Um, that's what they, that, that's the... That was the argument at the time. That's what they said. But as you hmm. grow up, maybe you realize there were other tensions going on, but we shan't get into that. Um, All right. But, yeah. So then you moved to the United Kingdom. Um, tell me about your, you know, pre-teen years and growing up in the UK. I was a huge tomboy. That's a major confession. Um, I was always an overachiever. 
but at the same time I was struggling between trying to be cool and fit in with like the Jamaican cool crowd who go to carnival <laughs> and party hmm. and not let anybody know that actually I have like a really high IQ and I go to Saturday school at Oxford University and I I play the piano and I also study ballet as well. Wow. So I didn't want the cool kids to know that. <laughs> so um, it was a bit of a balance trying to, um, one, please the parents as well as still mm -hmm. achieve the grades, but also fit in and make genuine friends and connections with people. Um, so it was a bit of a struggle growing up. And then I lived in a majority black neighborhood and there was a lot of Jamaicans and um, they all just thought I was from the Caribbean. And I used to tell wow. everybody, I'm Nigerian. And they'll go, no, 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 I think you, you must be from Antigua, man. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, if you say so. Um, so it's trying to fit in, but then still also trying to um, please the parents as well as know that I, who I am and not do myself a disservice at the end of the day. Um, traveled a lot as a family, still do all my family travel. A lot. My mom travels a lot. My dad, when he was alive, we traveled. So the good thing is, Annually, um, we always used to come to Nigeria for holiday. Oh. So whether it's Christmas holiday or whether it's a summer holiday, at least once a year, we'd always as a family spend time in Nigeria, which I'm really grateful for. So mm. that way I never really lost, lost touch with the nuances and the culture okay. of, you know, of Nigeria. So I understand Yoruba. My accent is very questionable. <laughs> but then again, I speak a few languages, French, mm. Spanish, I understand Italian, a little bit of Portuguese. And uh, I'm just glad that I was able to still have that connection mm. between um, you know, the UK and Nigeria. So when I decided to eventually move back, it wasn't a culture shock. So you came back to Nigeria often. Um, what were your fond, um, maybe not so fond memories uh, from back then? From coming to Nigeria on yes. holiday? Wow. <laughs> Gosh, I hope my parents don't see this. <laughs> I hope my mom doesn't see this. Partying. I'd always mm. like, oh, I'm going to go stay at my cousin's house, but I'll go with my brother to my older brother to a party somewhere. Um, and I learned how to drive in Nigeria. So I think mm. I was 14 or 15, and I just took a car that was in my... My dad used to have quite a few cars. Um, I'll just take one of these little cars, and my dad was pretty flexible, um, bless him. He'll just take whatever car that has petrol, I don't mm. care. And I'd get a driver to teach me how to drive a manual car. Wow. So as soon as I was confident enough, like 14, 15, I'm off. And then I'll just tell my parents, and we didn't really have mobile phones like that as well. So yes. I'll tell my so parents. So couldn't track you. Exactly. I'm staying <laughs> in my cousin's house. I'm staying in this person's mm. house. But like, I might be at 11.45. Wow. Wow. <laughs> 14. Maybe, no, okay. maybe, maybe like 16. <laughs> then I was probably like 16, 17. Okay. So then you went to university um, and you started journalism and creative writing at the Roehampton University? Yes. Correct. Journalism, creative writing and Spanish ah, at Roehampton University. Yeah. So why, why, what informed, you know, that, you know, choice? Well, Fab, <laughs> <laughs> I had this crazy dream that I was going to be the the first black editor of Vogue. I wanted to kick Anna Wintour off. Mm. And um, I thought that, because I've always loved fashion, to be honest. Okay. Um, if anybody knows me, I, mm. I pride myself in supporting local communities. Um, so whichever country I'm living in at the time, I'm definitely gonna support the local artisans. Um, and for me, that was just an expression of myself in a way that I feel, uh, also philanthropic side, that I thought if I'm helping other people in the community, then hey, that's a good thing. Um, so I started doing a lot of fashion journalism. I went to Fashion mm. Week. I had a lot of friends who were um, who went to St. Martin's School, oh. Fashion School, London School of Fashion. Um, my mum was also a designer as well growing oh, up. Great. So yeah, that, that whole arts and creative side mm. is very prevalent in my family. And um, I just literally thought that was going to be my dream job. At that time, I was putting a lot of pressure on myself. And I thought, OK, do you know what? Just pinpoint the main job that you want your dream job and study whatever you think would help you achieve that. And okay. I just thought, yeah, I could so be the editor of Vogue. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but then you didn't uh, exactly move to Vogue. You went to Google UK. Yeah. Um, how long were you there for? And uh, all your key highlights from that oh, time. Oh, I loved Google. Um, I was there for about two years. Hmm. But then again, I fell into it. It wasn't ever anything mm. that I purposely went out of my way initially. So part of my whole 
aspiration to be this editor of Vogue, um, I started designing clothes myself. Okay. Um, so selling bits and bobs, and I thought, right, I can't afford a store. I can't afford a brick and mortar store and all the overheads that that comes with. So let me start an online business and perhaps I could sell my designs online and I need okay. to know how to market my business. Hmm. So I decided to study for the Google AdWords exam whilst I was in my final year of uni. Hmm. Um, so I did the exam and I'm one of those that I will kind of stalk. I'll find out who the people are that work somewhere and where they like to drink, if right. they like to have Starbucks coffee, I'll go to that specific. So I was always hanging out around Victoria where the Google office, head office was in, the, in London. Um, and I'll just, oh, you work for Google. Oh, who did it? This is what I do. Blah, 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 blah. So I'll just like network. Mm -hmm. And um, before I knew it, I networked my way through to a few of the senior C-level, um, co uh, well, I won't say colleagues, but staff members. Um, <laughs> And luckily, I actually pretty much got 100% once again in the Google AdWords. And they're like, yeah, you did really well. And the position has come here. Would you be interested? And I was like, OK, wow, oh, sure. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, of course, like the interview process is so rigorous. Mm. Like they make you jump through so many hoops. But um, it was really enlightening. And, you know, it's fun, highly stressful. You don't sleep a lot. Mm -hmm. And I was working on so many different time zones as well. So whether it's Asia first, then I'll do the Euro European market, then you end with the American market. And mm -hmm. just coming straight out of university and, you know, jumping into that was pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, loved the experience. But then I had to take a step back after a while. After a couple of years, I was like, hey, this is not your editor passion that you really wanted. You know, you're no longer the editor. You're not the editor of Vogue. What's, the, what's happened to that dream? Um, and then I then had an introspective moment, um, especially my mum fell ill. She had bad arthritis in her knees and um, she had to get knee replacement in um, surgery in India. And I remember seeing her and this is a woman that, you know, super strong for me and I saw her really weak and frail. Then it kind of just had a really introspective moment mm -hmm. where I thought, okay, um, my dad always lived in Nigeria. Okay. My mum lived in the UK until I was about 15, 16, and then she moved back to Nigeria. So I lived with my older brother, Chasson. And I just thought, okay, I've known my siblings, I know my siblings pretty well, but I don't really know my parents mm -hmm. as much as I'd like to. And this health scare just kind of highlighted how fickle life is um, and anything could have happened. And I just thought, I want to spend a bit more time with my parents, especially getting to know my dad um, a lot better. Because... Simple things. My friends would say, oh, my dad's favorite color is blue. My mom's favorite this is that. And I was like, what's my dad's favorite color? You had no clue. I had no clue, mm -hmm. you know? And I just thought, I don't want to live my life like that. I want to have a bit of a better relationship with them. So I started juggling what is most important to me, what is my definition of a successful life. My dad was an entrepreneur. My mom's an entrepreneur. My brother's an entrepreneur. And for me, the ultimate... Um, definition of success was to become an entrepreneur. So um, looking at the market, um, especially the Nigerian market, West African market, Sub-Saharan Africa as a whole, um, I thought that I saw the opportunities. Um, of course, being underdeveloped also has its own perks because mm. then it's almost the real land of opportunities. So it's just about that patience, having that tenacity, identifying the opportunities. And mm -hmm. I thought, right, I can't really do that and understand the market from the UK coming over once a month or once a year for a couple of weeks in a month um, on holidays. So I decided to move to Nigeria, get to know my parents. 2010. In 2010. Yeah. January 2010, I moved to Nigeria. Um, after about a month, I ran away though. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Why? Why did you? Because, um, okay. Normally when I come to Nigeria, it's Christmas holidays, people have mm -hmm. normally left to go back to their village and uh -huh. there was no traffic, mm -hmm. so I didn't really get to see the real Lagos hustle and bustle. Um, and then I remember driving myself, I was going to a few appointments, meetings, um, and I was driving myself and I, we did not, I did not move and I was there alone for about three hours. Wow. stand still and I didn't have a clue what was going on I'm like I have to get because I lived on the mainland at that time in my family's house and I was like how am I going to get home there's traffic and then I had Okada drivers like hitting my car some person hit me and then they started shouting at me I was just so frustrated 
I, I thought my head was going to explode from stress. <laughs> Eventually, when I managed to get home, um, my dad took my blood pressure, and for the first time ever, my blood pressure had just shot up through the roof, and I was like, I think Nigeria might be bad for my health. <laughs> so let me just go back to what I, you know, the status quo. Mm. Um, I went back to the UK for maybe like another two, three months. It's terribly bored. It was middle of winter. I was like, do you know what? Nah, that ain't go back. Stick it out. So what if people, you were stuck in traffic, everybody else was stuck in traffic, you'll just have to get over it. Get a driver. Mm. So um, that was my solution. I told my dad I'm not coming back till he gets me a driver. So mm. <laughs> that he did, and I came back, and I've been here ever since. But luckily, my job enables me to travel a lot, so right. I don't feel apart from corona. So you came in in 2010 for the second time and landed a gig as an OAP, um, a radio presenter at... Uh, Radio Continental. How you, did you have land? done your research. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. How did you land that gig? So I went to TV Continental, actually, to pitch myself as a producer. Because, oh. of course, my dad owns an ad agency. My brother owned a production company in the UK. I've done a lot of work for the two of them, from writing content for my dad to actually producing full-on TV commercials, music videos um, for my brother's production company. As well as my ex experience and expertise as a journalist, I thought, okay, I could definitely create great content. Um, let me see the local TV stations, the local companies that would benefit from my expertise. So I actually went to TV Continental mm -hmm. to pitch myself as a potential producer. Um, when I arrived there, no shade to TVC because you're definitely changed now. But back then, their equipment, I could, I didn't even, I'd never seen it. I was like, this is, the, I, I think I saw this in the museum. Yeah, like, does this really work? So I just thought I wasn't going to regress in terms of my skill sets because um, I'd have to learn how to do things, quote unquote, the archaic way or, yeah, the wrong way as far as I was concerned. And I wasn't willing to do that. Um, so uh, coincidentally, as I stepped out of that production meeting, um, after I'd done, had a tour of this studio and everything, I stepped out of the production meeting and actually bumped into Uncle Femi Shoulu, um, who's a well-known radio presenter. Mm -hmm. He's got the voice of Gulda mm -hmm. or something. And he's actually my dad's friend. I mean, known to me at the time, he was actually the head of radio of, for Radio Continental, a head of programs or manager. Mm -hmm. I can't remember the job title, but he was the head of Radio Continental. So we were just catching up because I hadn't seen him for at least five years. And, um, you know, it's my, fam my dad's family friend. Um, he'd come to some of our parties and things like that. So how's the family? How are the kids? He invited me into the radio station and we were just talking. And then but at the end of the meeting, it was like, oh, it was so great to see you. Um, so have you ever thought about being on radio? And I was like... No, like I can't even listen to my voice in a voicemail. Like I don't even think I sound good. Why would I want to be in radio? Like I'm okay to be behind the scenes, just producing content, just leave it as that. And he's like, no, I think you really have something here that would really be refreshing to the airwaves. And I was like, okay, but Radio Continental, like you guys are a little bit indigenous. My British accent right now is not a that as strong as it was ten years ago. Two, I used to speak very fast. Um, so I really had to learn how to slow down when I'm talking mm. on radio. Um, so he was the first person that trained me for radio. He said, yeah, come over. We can give you maybe like one or two days a week, two or three hours max, you know, nothing. Just so, and I was like, okay, well, if they're going to pay me and it's literally 10 minutes drive from my family house, hey, why not? So he said I needed to come to radio for two weeks and shadow him. And he did the breakfast show. After two weeks, I was like, okay, so there's an opening this evening, Friday evening from 9 till midnight, and Saturday from 8 p.m. till 10. Are you okay to do those hours? I was like, okay. And literally, that's how I started working on Radio Continental. Wow. My show trended, and I didn't even know what trending was because I didn't even have a Twitter account. Um, so apparently, the Radio Continental, my Club Express show, was trending on uh, social media every weekend mm -hmm. above other popular radio stations. And um, before I knew it, other radio stations were calling me to offer me a job, to offer me a job. So, like I said, I don't really plan or really apply for mm. jobs. They kind of just unfold. Came to you. The and universe I'm... conspires for, thing, mm. for great things to happen to me mm -hmm. and for me to just be where I need to be. And I'm 
open enough to these opportunities and just to go with the flow. If it's presented to me, I always feel like, okay, this must be here for a reason. Hmm. Let me explore it and what's the worst that can happen. Yeah. So, and I'm guessing that's how um, you went on to be a radio presenter at Beat FM. Um, you did some work at Guardian, newspapers, 234 Next, PM News, you even had a TV show, Glam Report. How would you, you know, sum up uh, your career as a journalist? Um, journalism for me has been the foundation of being able to organize my thoughts and see things in, an, in a more unbiased way. Because if you're going to report the truth, you kind of should give both sides of the story to make it a balanced report. And I feel like because that was my that was my formal training, it's a transferable skill that I've been able to utilize across board. The skill sets that I learned from journalism, I feel, has been the solid foundation to open up all the doors that I've had um, and all the opportunities that I've had so far, which I'm really grateful for. All right, so you would leave radio, um, that's BTFM now, uh, in 2016, to run your uh, uh, production company, I'm guessing, Film Factory, right? Absolutely. Um, so I was, so I moved to Nigeria in 2010. In 2011, um, my older brother Chasson and I decided to open up Film Factory Productions. So everybody knows, um, you know, most people know that he's a very popular producer, but he doesn't live in Nigeria. Um, and he's also, he, at that time, he had another production company in the UK um, that he was running. So we were heavily focused on, on, on m m music videos. Mm -hmm. um, just to give a little bit of context, actually, just to know how my mind works, and I think it's important for people to, especially when you're going into anything, you should always have a bit of a strategy behind it. Mm -hmm. So knowing that I wanted to launch my production company, um, which we did around August, September 2011, knowing that my weak point um, was the fact that I didn't know a lot of artists. I haven't lived in Nigeria since I was seven, so I didn't know the music too, too well. Um, it's going to be an uphill struggle for me to get to shoot music videos for artists because I have to mm. first of all find them, I've got to convince them, I've got to... So I thought, um, looking at the market, when I came, uh, Beat FM was highly respected and it was like the new buzz radio station that a lot of artists seemed to really respect and wanted their music played on. Mm. Um, so I thought if I get myself on, on that station, then I can kill two birds with one stone. A, of course, work for the station, but then I have the best or the most popular artists come to me. And then off air, I can then pitch my production company and shoot their video. And um, it worked swimmingly. <laughs> so that was a that's, good strategy. That's um, an amazing strategy. <laughs> so um, that quickly spurred on the wheel and gave us momentum. And within five years, we actually started turning down artists, like, you know, whether they didn't have the budget or we were just too busy. I literally decided um, I'm going to focus on building Film Factory even more and innovating the business model where it's about 70% corporate and 30% music videos, which we executed extremely well. Mm -hmm. um, so January 2016, I officially left Beat FM to run Film Factory single-handedly. And um, it was as a result of that, even doing more corporate productions, traveling across sub-Saharan Africa, shooting documentaries for General Electric, for Microsoft, um, and traveling, I realized just how fragmented the, in, the, the media industry was. Um, so the pre-production part of my business was actually the most inefficient. Sourcing the talent was incredibly difficult. Um, the communication between production house, ad agency, client, for them to make one decision could take like two or three weeks. And I could be stuck in a country, maybe I'm in Angola, and I'm waiting for a client to come back on a decision on which model they liked. So it just became incredibly time consuming, um, labor and labor intensive and just inefficient. And I just thought, how could I automate this process? How could I do something or is there anything that could automate this process for me? Um, and Bookings Africa then came about as a result of the frustrations that I faced as a producer. So yeah, that I, I left radio, I went to production and, and then, then entered Bookings Africa. Stepped away from production. Baby. And that was in April of 2019. 
Oh, I God. left Bukinza, I left Film Factory officially. Um, when I say left, I didn't, I stepped away from the operations and as an exec producer. Um, it was end of 2017. So I started January 2018 as a full time, the only Bookings Africa staff officially. So January mm -hmm. 2018. Um, but I didn't release my, um, what we call MVP, my minimum viable product. So it's like the, test website to actually see is this not just I just I want to make sure it's not just a good idea I actually want to make sure it's a viable business um, which is what I did and that was in April 2019 the first website for okay. Bookings Africa went live and that was interesting because I was trying to raise money before the website went live in April and I kept getting the same feedback from all investors was great idea great business model but we need to see an MVP we need to see a prototype of this product of this website or of mm. this app what is it physically going to look like? What's the user journey going to be like? We just, they wanted just like a reference point. Um, and as soon as I got the website up and running in April, I mean, we went to Cannes together, didn't we? Mm -hmm. um, in May? Eight, no, June? June. June. We went uh, together to Cannes in June 2019. 2019 yes. I came back and in August, I'd raised money. I'd raised over $300,000 from Amazing. my investors. Hi, my name is Fadi Ogunro, and you too can be an under 40 CEO.